Australia we live in today is very different from the one of our parents and grandparents. In the 1950s, my mum could stay at home and raise the kids because you could buy a house on a big block of land with a single income. Now you need two incomes for an apartment or a house miles out of town on a very small block. Australia's relationship with housing has fundamentally changed in the past 70 years. The comparison to where we are now to where we were 70 years ago is astonishing. You only needed four times, five times your income in order to afford a house. It's not only the type of housing that's changed, it's also whether you can even enter home ownership. The question is, what's the solution? And that's what first home buyers like Cherry Clark would like to know. I'm living here with uh, my partner, my two children, and also my in-laws. We couldn't afford both renting and, you know, saving up enough money and time for our kids not to be, you know, 18. <laughs> Trying to find a 20% deposit is extreme in my mind. On normal wages of full-time work, even for a $300,000 loan, I try to put in the effort to get that deposit and then it suddenly increases and it's just a never ending battle. About two and a half hours east of Melbourne in Tarogan, houses are no longer affordable for many young working families. When I first got here about four or five years ago, houses were looking at the 180 mark, whereas now they're easily, easily into the 400s. The area that we can afford there's no way that I would go for a walk without my partner with me or with my kids. There's no way I'd let my kids ride a bike down the street or walk to school. It hurts to think that I have to sacrifice uh, the safety of my children just for a roof over our head. The approach of both major parties is not to deal with affordability, but to help a few people get around it. The Coalition's Home Guarantee Scheme will allow up to 50,000 people to buy a house with as little as 5% deposit, saving buyers the cost of expensive lenders insurance because the government will instead be the loan guarantor. Labor's main policy is the Help to Buy Shared Equity Scheme, with 10,000 places in which the government owns up to 40% of the house if it's new, or 30% if it's existing. Labor is also proposing to set up a fund that will build social housing, about 30,000 of them. Meanwhile, the Coalition's pledged another $2 billion worth of low-cost loans for social housing providers. And the policies of income caps, meaning not everyone can apply. You can already use your super to purchase an investment property, but not your own home. And then on Sunday, the Coalition used its campaign launch to announce another scheme, a plan to allow first home buyers to withdraw up to 40% of their super balance early, up to a maximum of 50,000. We will see a surge in housing prices if this scheme actually does get up. And this is the problem uh, with these schemes is that you see a price adjustment very quickly and really only the first few home buyers that get in early actually get the real benefit. If the goal here is to improve housing affordability, well, this is counterproductive. They hand out money in some way or form to every home buyer, that means the market reacts by growing house prices. That's a problem. They want to own their house. They Scott Morrison argues the Coalition's other new election policy, tax incentives to encourage older people to sell up, will offset any price rises. Now the downsizing policy actually gets more housing stock into the market. And so the suggestion this will have any sort of significant impact here, I just don't think bears up to scrutiny. But critics argue first home buyers wouldn't be able to afford the large family homes which older Australians would be downsizing from. The government's own housing minister, Michael Sukkar, declined an interview with 7.30 to discuss the policies. Neither party really sounds too great to me on, on, that, you know, on that platform of trying to help housing markets and trying to help the typical Australian family and things like that. We've got our drop saws. Cherry, who is about to start her cabinet-making apprenticeship, qualifies for all the potential schemes. She's only got about $10,000 in her super, meaning she could withdraw around four grand to help her under the coalition policy. She worries it will be a band-aid solution and could lead to further price inflation. 
My partner is also an apprentice. Um, he works at a mechanics. I can never buy a house on my income alone. And even having both of us working full time, it is still a struggle to kind of pull it all together. It's in everybody's mind. The dream for a family is to have your own home, have your own stability. And when you feel like you can't make it there because of something, a hurdle that seems so impossible, it can get really depressing. In the past 40 years, there have been four big housing booms that have more than doubled the price of housing relative to income. Now, globally, on average, houses have become cheaper relative to income. Now, there have been dozens of inquiries and reports into housing affordability over that time, but politicians only ever come up with ideas that result in driving prices higher by subsidising buyers. Nicole Garan, what's the first thing that should be done to deal with housing affordability? Look, the real problem with housing affordability is that affecting low and moderate income renters. And to fix that problem, we need to return to properly funding social and affordable housing supply. It's quite ironic that we've heard politicians on both sides, you know, wring their hands about the lack of housing supply in Australia when the one thing that would make a tangible difference is if we reinvested in the nation's social and affordable housing stock. We've got to find a way to introduce more supply relative to buyer demand. If we were to do that, then we would go some way to addressing the issues. In order to make sure that we spread our population growth more evenly across more cities, we just need to make more housing, more land, more jobs available in these secondary cities. In order to provide more housing, you need to build more housing. That means you need more land to be made available. In Australia, local government areas are extremely powerful and they can control the land supply and lots of local government areas are holding back land. Right, so it's NIMBY. It's, it's NIMBY, so it's NIMBYism driven by local government areas. And you could easily fix this by saying we take the land supply um, powers away from local government areas. Could that be done with a federal law? Oh, it could definitely be done. Just from a legal perspective, you could easily legislate this to be done, but you would have uh, tons of fight back there. But I think it is probably the smartest solution. Well, Jason Clare, what are you doing to make housing itself less unaffordable. Well, there's no easy fix to this. There's a bunch of different things you have to do here. So one of them is help people on lower incomes to buy a home. Another one is you've got to do something about supply. There are log jams there that you can potentially fix. The other big part here is the construction of more housing for people on really low incomes. I'm talking about social housing. But what about the affordability, the actual price of houses? I don't think anyone's proposing that they, they want to cut the cost of housing. Housing has, has increased dramatically. You need policies that can adapt and deal with that. Part of it is helping to make sure that people earn better wages. You're saying that it's not possible to do anything about that? Well, I don't think anyone would want to see that. You know, anybody who owns a home wants to see it appreciate. If house prices were to drop, the economic impact uh, for Australia would be phenomenal. That's right. Nobody who owns a home wants to see prices drop. But turning the family home into an investment asset with tax breaks, at the same time as immigration increased the demand for shelter, has not just caused an affordability problem for those who don't own a home already, it's fundamentally transformed society. Education and hard work no longer determine how much wealth you build. Now it depends on where you live and what you inherit. And that is worsening inequality. For a growing number of, of young families, getting into home ownership is dependent on the bank of mum and dad. That starts to create a two-tier system where you've got generations of families that are in home ownership and generations of families that are not. I think your institute has modelled the impact of tax changes on the housing market. What did you find? Well, the, the, the net benefit of, of, of reforming those taxes would be considerable. The challenge is not the tax system per se, the challenge is actually the political terrain and navigating that. The question of negative gearing was made toxic by Labor's loss in 2019 and now nobody wants to talk about it. Do you think that's ever going to come back on the agenda? Well, we took it to two elections and we lost. We live in a democracy, you've got to learn from that. Do you think that negative gearing is ever going to come back on the agenda? Well, uh, certainly not in this election, I don't think it will come back. But I do think the problem is there, the problem is real 
and we've got to come up with other ways to fix it. So is it possible that, like with the GST and John, what John Howard did, that in the next election, if you win this one, you'll go to the next election with a proposal to do something about tax? No. Absolutely not? Yeah, absolutely not. We need to have an honest discussion what we want housing to be in Australia. We cannot say we want housing to be a wonderful investment projectile um, and also make it affordable for people. You can't have both. If you want to make housing affordable, if you want to get as many Australians into the house as humanly possible, it will become a less attractive investment. Well, now interest rates are rising, which is usually a sure cure for expensive housing. The trouble is that even when interest rates went to 17%, house prices only fell about 10 to 15%. And after last year's 22% rise, that's probably not enough now. And those who have bought lately and borrowed to the eyeballs definitely don't want house prices to fall at all. What do you think of the, the government policies that are in place to help people buy a house with a smaller deposit, with either a 5% and in some cases 2% deposit? The danger there is twofold, that interest rates go up and as a result prices go down, which means that someone has paid more than the house is worth and, and if they've borrowed 98% of that, the chances are they owe more than the house is now worth. They'll make a loss on, on trying to get out. That's a trap that, that we need to be very careful with with those schemes. You have this big generation of millennials now struggling to get into the housing market and this is a ticking time bomb. Um, politically speaking, because you do have angry voters, you do have people that might become lifelong renters at a higher rate. We've seen politicians telling us that the housing problem is just too complex to fix, when in fact, if you look at the evidence, the political problem of perhaps addressing tax reform may be too complicated to fix. But the solutions to Australia's housing problem are very obvious and they're right there on the table. The first step in dealing with housing affordability is to actually try to deal with it, rather than make announcements that help a few people get around the problem. And as we've just heard, the answer is simple, but hard and expensive. First, build a lot more social housing. Second, release more land and build infrastructure to it. And third, stop giving property investors unlimited tax breaks. That's it. Hi, I'm Lee Sales. Thanks for watching this story. If you'd like to watch more of 7.30's stories, they are on the left of your screen. And tap on the button below to subscribe and get the latest from ABC News.